Hello, good morning. Welcome everyone. Let's give it up one more time for the Thunder Squad. What an incredible way to start the day. We're so excited to see all of your smiling faces. You made it after the Bold Bash. But rise and shine because we have an incredible lineup for you today. I'm Kristen Carrico, and I lead the customer experience team here at MindBody. And I'm Peter Hughes. I'm a leader in marketing at MindBody. And I agree, Kristen, that was so much fun. And I'm excited to see the Thunder Squad again in a short while. So this session, we're trying something just a little different, something we've never done before. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, you'll meet five people who've had very different, very profound, and ultimately, life-changing experiences. They will each share an idea, a spark, a story that has defined and shaped the way they see the world. And through these presentations, we hope to inspire you and leave you feeling unstoppable. Our first speaker is an athlete of remarkable skill and strength. He recently competed at the World CrossFit Games, deadlifting over 500 pounds and taking third place overall. Yes, give it up. His secret, being able to adapt. Please welcome the founder of the Adaptive Training Academy, Logan Aldridge. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Uh, I know you, a lot of you all might have been out late last night having a little bit of fun. I hate I wasn't there to join you, but I hope you are here ready to have some energy this morning and get fired up about what we have to talk about. So if you're with me, if you hear me, and you're ready to go, on the count of three, I'd like two claps. One, two, three. Oh, I love it. High level of engagement with the audience. Thanks, guys. All right, let's get into it. I'm Logan Aldridge. I want to tell you about a date that is very special to me. June 26, 2004. It's a long time ago. Gosh, almost 20 years ago. To me, it's a date that feels like yesterday. Not because it has some negative meaning or effect, but because it's a moment that defined my life in a direction that was unexpected. This day was a Saturday uh, out in North Carolina. I born and raised in North Carolina. My whole family is a bunch of recreational water skiers. And this day was another day of me practicing training to become a professional competitive wakeboarder. Who in here is familiar with wakeboarding? Oh, awesome. A lot of people. So wakeboarding is the, the idea of riding a board behind a boat, jumping the waves to do flips and tricks and spins. So I just finished a training day at the age of 13, pretty young, with a friend of mine who lived a few docks down. We went to drop him off at his dock, finished up the Saturday session, said, good job, dude. See you in the morning. Let's go have dinner. We'll see you in the morning. We drop him off at his dock. I got my mom, my dad on the boat. They're always on there when we're training. And I began to tidy up the boat, like I always do after a day of riding, putting away life jackets, grabbing the rope. Now, if you're familiar with the way a wakeboard boat is set up and where the rope is, it's attached to this tower. This tower is kind of like right above the middle of the boat and goes out the back so that the rider has some air when they jump. With the rope being connected to that, that tower and the rest of the rope out the back of the boat, we pushed away from my friend's dock and just had to put like five docks down, just going real slow about this speed in the boat. I began to pull in the rope, like I always do, using this technique of looping it over my thumb and under my elbow. Kind of like you hold your arm like this, like you do with an extension cord. You guys know what I'm talking about? You make those perfect circles. I had a couple loops like that wrapped around my left arm. I looked at the rope. I followed the, the rope out the back of the boat. And on a wakeboard boat, there's a platform on the back of the boat where you put on your board and you jump in the water. The motor of the boat is actually almost up underneath the boat. So as I looked back and noticed that that rope kind of drifted right over the plat back of the platform and it looked like it was underneath it a little bit, I turned to my dad, standing there with the two loops around my arm, and said, oh, Dad, rope's underneath the boat again. It happens sometimes when you're being a little bit careless, not paying attention. It's not a huge alarm. There's a lot of stuff back there that might be getting caught on that isn't the propeller. So it wasn't a huge alarm. But in that moment, I just said, oh, rope's caught underneath the boat again, Dad. He quickly goes to turn off that, the motor so that just to be cautious about the propeller near the rope. 
And that split second, when he turns off the motor, just four feet from me, standing on the back platform of the boat, that rope gets caught by the propeller. It was further underneath the boat than I had thought, than he had thought, than we had expected. That rope instantly got caught by that propeller. Again, mind you, we were just in gear. We were just putting along, just moving. But that propeller's moving so fast, and this rope specifically is almost like a cable. In wakeboarding, you don't want any elasticity with the rope. So this rope literally was coated in plastic and very thin, acted like a cable. So in this instance, if I painted this picture correctly for you, you can imagine I'm standing here holding this rope over my thumb, under my elbow, connected to the tower, out the back of the boat, caught in the propeller, instantly breaks my thumb, slips off of my thumb, and cinches down around my upper arm, bicep and tricep, cutting down to the bone. Now, I know this is a little bit graphic, so bear with me, but I do like to paint this picture appropriately for you. I didn't rip my arm off. I was just standing there on the back of the boat, and all of a sudden my arm was just here, just looking at my arm. And I was looking at a rope coming in one side, going out the other side. No blood at this moment, just shocked at what just happened. A little bit of a pull, standing here looking at my arm. My mother immediately says to my dad, Wesley, his arm, he steps over, begins to unwind this rope from my arm. As soon as he does so, a massive amount of blood shoots across this 23-foot white boat, turning it red in a matter of seconds. He rips off his shirt, wraps it around my arm, pulls it as tight as he can, sticks a stick in there, and twists it to create a tourniquet. Had he not done so, I would have bled and died in a few minutes. My artery in my left arm was severed. Everything was severed down to the bone. We get to the dock. We are wondering what to do next. My parents don't have a clear path for this unexpected event that just occurred. I remember telling my dad, as we get off of the boat, in the middle of nowhere, by the way, this lake is, uh, Lake Gaston is in the middle of North Carolina, Virginia border, kind of in the middle of nowhere. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know a hospital to go to. But I knew that this was not happening. I knew this wasn't real. This wasn't expected. It's not what we're supposed to do. It's a Saturday. I'm training. I'm just going to go home, eat dinner. We're going to wake up and work on wakeboarding again. This is not supposed to happen. So I tell my dad as we get, he's carrying me off the boat. I said, Dad, just bring me up the, up the walkway. Bring me into the house. Show me myself. Bring me to my bedroom. You'll show me myself, and I'll wake up from this nightmare. This is not happening. This is not happening. He says, Logan, I'm sorry, but I'll show you. So he brings me up, shows me my bed. I look at my bed, recognize, realize I'm not there. Take a deep breath as he's holding me in his arms. We carry me out to the driveway, and I immediately start to recognize the reality of the situation. Unexpected, unforeseen event that, uh, who knows? what this outcome might be. We lay there in the driveway for an hour waiting for the ambulance to get to me, voluntary crew. It was a big summer day and not very busy in the hospital. They show up, my mom gets in the ambulance with me. We begin our ride to the local community hospital. On that ride, I begin to contemplate the severity of this just all of a sudden freak accident. It happened in a split second. And I'm fine, I'm conscious, I'm here, but my arm is just, it's laying in my lap, but I feel like it's laying on the side of me. And I remember looking at my mom in the ambulance or in the ride and saying to my mom, Mom, what, what if I lose my arm? It was the first moment where it came into my mind, like, okay, this might not just be a scar I have. I might not have my arm anymore. When I said, Mom, what if I lose my arm? She looked at me without skipping a beat and she said, Logan, it's just an arm. That statement is the most profound statement that I could have ever heard in that moment, and it's a statement that I use to this day to guide myself when things get tough, when I'm faced with a challenge, when an obstacle is presented, when my mind and perspective has shifted into a negative place, or woe is me, or I can't, I remind myself, Logan, it's just an arm. Those words in the moment for her, I think were just the way for her to cope with the fact that her son just had this accident and bloodshed and she's just here to make sure he's alive and safe. And yes, that's exactly what that statement said to me too. That statement made me think, well, yeah, it's just, if, if I lose it, it is just an arm. I have another one. Man, it'd be great if I can just tell this story. It'd be great if I can just live to tell this story. And that's what happened. That's what that perspective was. 
we get to that local community hospital, they quickly realize there's nothing we can do here. We're not a level one trauma hospital. They call UNC Children's Hospital. They say, we've got a helicopter in the air on its way. Go to these coordinates. Put me back in the ambulance. We ride out to a cornfield to these coordinates. I am not making this up. This is like out of a movie. And I get out of this ambulance. They wheel me out in the stretcher. And I see this badass helicopter come landing in this field. And I turn to the paramedics. I go, that's for me? And they said, yeah. And I said, that's badass. And so they wheeled me out there, put me into this incredible helicopter. Coolest pilots, coolest crew. Still know these folks to this day. They brought me to UNC Children's Hospital where they immediately started ripping off the clothes and trying to figure out how to save my arm. Took an artery out of my leg to regain blood flow. Do everything that they could to save this arm. Because... I was also left-handed. And to the doctors, the medical communities, they were like, we need to save his dominant arm. It would, be a, it would be really helpful if we could. The reality of the matter was, today's medical technology, compared to where it was nearly 20 years ago, limb salvage was not where it is today. They could not get the appropriate blood flow to get the muscles to re-engage to save the arm. We'd missed that window. When you, let, when you have no blood flow, you have about six to seven hours to regain blood flow to introduce back to the limb. We were on the tail end of that, and those muscles just did not accept the blood. So the result was I had to amputate my left arm. That was tough. That was tough. I was in the hospital, had a lot of friends and family coming to visit me. Everyone was so sorry. So sorry. Rightfully so, I guess. But it was my first exposure to seeing what happens when folks put an expectation on you. Losing an arm, it's a big deal, right? Getting paralyzed, losing a leg, some traumatic accident that results in a permanent physical impairment, it's a big deal. But what happens to our narrative and perspective when our surrounding and our community makes it a, the biggest deal, makes it the most tragic, unfortunate event that's ever happened in our life? It becomes this adopted mentality of woe is me, this is going to be hard, I'm disabled now, I'm handicapped. I refused to accept that. I was beyond grateful and blessed to have so many people in my life to support me, to come tell me they're here for me. I had teachers from my school coming and tell me, Logan, you were left-handed, lost your dominant arm. Don't worry, we got note takers for you. Don't worry, we'll have a laptop for you. I went to school, I said, put all that crap away. I've got to learn how to write. It was my first exposure to expectations. Expectations were being placed on me left and right, and rightfully so, never out of a malicious place, but let's think about what expectations are, and especially in this scenario. They're prejudgments we place on ourselves and one another that typically limit our potential. Michael Jordan has a great quote, and he says, if we accept the expectations of others, especially the negative ones, we'll never change the outcome. Very, very much resonated with me in this moment. If I accepted that I'll never write again, I'll never wakeboard again, I'll never play lacrosse, I'll never golf, I'll never do the things I did before, then I would just be that person who I was expected to be. That's not how I wanted to live my life, and I was so fortunate at that time to have someone to look up to, to look towards. That person was Bethany Hamilton. Who here knows who Bethany Hamilton is just by saying the name? Very cool. If you don't, that's all right. Let me explain. Bethany Hamilton, about nine months before my accident, lost her arm in a shark attack in Hawaii. She's got an incredible movie about her called Soul, Surfle, Soul Surfer, and actually another recent film called Unstoppable. Highly recommend you guys check out. Bethany Hamilton and I are great friends now. I followed her and Alana Blanchard in their surfing uh, tour well before her accident. Saw her accident happen, was devastated. I'm an avid surfer as well. And I was in the hospital and got a phone call from Bethany saying, Logan, it's going to be okay. You're going to figure it out and move on. A year after my accident, I got to go out to Hawaii, teach Bethany how to wakeboard. She gave me some pointers on how to surf. We had an incredible engagement and were able to show each other that human potential is far greater than we know and experience. My message to you is to never set expectations on others or yourself unless you're willing to have them be exceeded. Expectations limit our potential. Human potential is far greater than you know or believe. And the only way that we tap into that is by deciding in our minds to create a breakthrough. And we do that by not accepting the expectations of others. Honing in your attitude and perspective dictates your ability. I have a short video I'd like to show you that is a micro example of the life that I've lived now since losing my arm. My mission is to empower people to pursue their human potential. 
I focus specifically on people with disabilities and creating more enabling environments for them. I'd like to show you this little video that explains just that. Hey, Madeline. Being a kid is a wild ride. When I was your age, I didn't know anyone else like us. Someone who knew the challenges we face. I want you to know that you are not alone. When things get harder, remember how strong you are. You are far more capable than you believe. When life gets difficult, challenge yourself to be stronger. I used to dream about having two arms again, but now I dream about what I can do with one. They keep telling me I'm no different than anybody else. But as I've grown up, you've helped me learn to accept it. And it has become who I am, not what I am. Our challenges just may be more visible than others. Life with one arm is hard to get used to. But I've learned not to stop. I can do the unexpected, beat the odds, and compete for glory. I wanted to say thanks for teaching me how to tie my shoes. Your friend, Madeline. Check you out. Good job, Pi. We're far more capable than we know or believe. Thank you all so much. Exceed expectations and be unstoppable. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Logan. You are such an inspiration. Next, we'd like to introduce marketing executive, lifelong athlete, wellness ad advocate, and adventurer. But then she was handed a terminal cancer diagnosis, and that changed everything. But now she's motivated to live with more intention and meaning and pay that forward to others. Her popular podcast, no Time to Waste has featured the likes of Katie Couric, Cheryl Sandberg, Chelsea Handler, Lance Armstrong, and my personal favorite, Matthew McConaughey. Please welcome to the stage the host of No Time to Waste, Allison Haddon. Let's give it up for Logan. Can we give it up again for Logan? Man, incredible story. Incredible story and really incredible video. I'm super jealous of that. Um, I am so happy to be here and I'm sorry, but listening to the physical claps, can you do it one more time? Yeah, we're here. It's been a year and a half of me going, let me clap if you're with me. And then I get a, does anybody know what this is? It's the Zoom clap, Josh McCarter. Yes, the Zoom clap. So I'm just so happy to be here. I'm sure all of you are. Um, I'd like to bring you back though to a time. So long ago, you may not even remember. April, 2020. I don't know about you, but ra raise your hand if it feels like 10 lifetimes ago. Yeah, right? Man, April 2020. You know, I want you to think about, or, or hopefully you are, you are already thinking about it, but what were you doing back in April 2020? Where were you living? Who were you living with? What was your job? Uh, raise your hand if your business was in crisis in April 2020. Yep, be it if you were a practitioner or a business owner right? Um, raise your hand if you had to pivot in some way, be it, you know, stream your classes, bring yoga and spin outside, um, or maybe just pivot your entire business model. Yeah. Right? And one more thing, raise your hand if you feel like you showed some grit and resilience and agility in April of 2020 during that time. 
Yeah, clap for yourselves. It's been a road. It's been a road. Well, April 2020 was a, a time for me as well. It was a, it was a tough time. <laughs> um, backing up a bit, in 2018, in the fall, I was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. Um, after 15 months of all the treatments, I thought that the cancer story was behind me. Um, and in April of 2020, I mentally started to have challenges communicating. I couldn't find words. I was really quiet. I began to withdraw. And very rapidly, I deteriorated mentally and physically to the point where they brought me in for a brain CT. Um, and usually after you get, uh, after you get a, a scan, you know, you get your results in a couple days, right? Um, maybe, maybe later on that day. And I'm walking out after getting changed for my scan and I hear the tech go, wait, wait. And I turn around and she says, you need to bring this disc to your oncologist at the cancer center. He's waiting for you. You need to go right now. FYI, this is never, this is never good news. You know, you know it's not good, right? When they're saying, we're gonna squeeze you in and he's waiting for you. So it turns out, I had a brain tumor the size of a small lemon in my frontal lobe. It is what gave me this now kind of bad, badass looking scar. Um, but, uh, and by the way, if you're like, a lemon's not that big, it is for a brain tumor. Um, so I had, uh, they said, we need to get you in immediately um, because the swelling in your brain is so significant, there is a high likelihood that you will have a seizure that could be fatal. <laughs> so, um, sense of urgency, to say the least. Um, they uh, checked me in on the spot, and about 30 hours later, I was on the operating room uh, table, I guess it was, I don't remember, I was out, um, and I had an emergency craniotomy, um, and luckily had a really fantastically successful surgery and life was good, right? I felt like I had cheated death once again. Um, the fighter in me was like, you're not gonna get me cancer, nice try, even in the brain. And I was told that I still might live out my full lifetime. So I was riding high, right? Well, as you can see, from this <coughs> snapshot of me ugly crying, that was not the case. And just a couple months later, if you'd like to read the blog post I hoped I never had to write, um, you can read it on my website at notimetowasteproject.com. Um, but I found out that the cancer had spread uh, all willy-nilly in my chest, untreated for a couple months, and my cancer was now terminal, um, where years aren't guaranteed anymore. I live scan to scan, which happens about every three months. Um, and when people say to me, oh my gosh, can I come visit in a couple months? And I'm like, <laughs> I was like, I'm like literally just looking at like the next week because I'm waiting on a medication switch. Um, so my life is challenging. Um, to say the least, but I'm in a room of people like me who are resilient, who are gritty, who pivoted when they needed to, as we just learned. And I feel like you guys, you guys would rise to the occasion just like I have. So <clears throat> after that diagnosis, um, I was hit with a lot of a lot of questions around what I wanted at end of life, right? Questions around, do I want a ventilator and a feeding tube if I find out that it's probably not going to come out? Or who's gonna speak for me if I can't speak for myself when it comes to decisions? I, I mean, 
questions are around end of life when I, you know, I was just like gonna go for like a hike or a run. Um, it was a lot, you know, confronting mortality is a lot. But spoiler alert, I'm not the only one that's gonna die. You with the pink, you're gonna die. And you in the front row with the gray t-shirt, you're gonna die too. Every single person in this room, and I'm not saying this to be a Debbie Downer, you're all going to die. It's just a matter of when, right? And it's so strange because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it at all. We keep these conversations just, you're morbid, you're, you're depressing if you talk about it. Um, and yet, if anyone, raise your hand if you've been through trauma or tragedy or loss or grief in your life, right? Everyone has. There is power in having that conversation be brought out of the darkness and into the light because it helps people feel less alone. It helps you feel like you're not going through all of that by yourself. And every time you have a conversation about tragedy or loss or trauma or death and dying, the reality of the situation, you are finding connection. And also, it's almost like um, exposure therapy where it takes the power out of it a bit and it normalizes it. Clap if you, if you agree, if you've been there and you're like, let's talk about it, yes. Memento Mori, if you want to learn more about it, it's essentially the practice of being aware of your own death in a non-morbid, non-scary, kind of a, just objective way, even if it's for 20 seconds a day. Um, it's a Catholic ritual I learned from uh, a nun that I had on my podcast recently. Um, you can find it at uh, No Time to Waste Project on Instagram. But Memento Mori, it's just about keeping things top of mind. You know, in order to live the life today without regrets. So when people say to me, I don't, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you get out of bed every day. I think about this quote that I found when I think I first got diagnosed in 2018. He who has a why to live, it's from Nietzsche, can bear almost any how. So he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. I have found my why. My why is in spreading the message of no time to waste through speaking engagements like these, but also through my podcast. No time to waste is all about doing that hard work of confronting your mortality, crafting a life without regrets, and maximizing moments focused on the three things that I think matter most, maximizing moments based on gratitude, human connection, and joy. Period, full stop. That's what I talk to my guests about. That's what I talk to audience members about. Um, it's not about dying and death. It's about living and life. And that is the message that I try and spread to as many people as I can. So I'm gonna share three things, thank you. I'm gonna share three things with you that you can do today, today, to start living life like there's no time to waste. Okay, number one, ground yourself in the present. So I just got back into yoga, like daily yoga, which, man, Raise your hand if you're a yoga practitioner or you own a yoga studio. Yeah, I, I have never needed the practice more than I do now. For the first time, it has nothing to do with the physical. It has all to do with right here. My instructor says, try and keep your brain with your body. And at first I was like, I was like, try, try and keep your brain with your body. What does that even mean, right? It means be in the present moment. And whenever I feel like 
I am not in the present moment. All I have to do is put my hand on where my left breast used to be, um, the other hand on my stomach, and take some deep breaths, and all of a sudden I'm in the present. And even in my situation, when I have so many fears of what the future holds, the present moment is usually okay. Second, live today without regrets. I'm just gonna read them. This is from one of the largest research studies around deathbed regrets that, that exist. One, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. Four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And five, I wish I had let myself be happier. Okay? I want you to think about that because we can't predict when we're going to die, but knowing this, inside scoop on me, <laughs> I'll let you know, I am more afraid of regrets than I am of dying. And I mean that. So, no regrets. And finally, this is my favorite, because this is about joy. Don't wait to do the things. If you're like, I don't have time for that, or, you know, that sounds really fun, but, you know, I've got some other work to do, don't wait. Or, you know, yes, I should go see, you know, my family, but it's been a couple years, and don't wait. These are things that I've done since my terminal diagnosis. I don't I don't put them off anymore because of my situation, but you shouldn't put them off anymore either. I had something called a life list. Don't ask me. But when I was a teenager, I essentially started not a bucket list because it's not about dying or death, but a life list. It included aspirational things I wanted to do, places I wanted to travel to, things I wanted to give to people, ranging from you know, go on an African safari, which I did with my little sister in 2019, to uh, give a deserving restaurant server a $100 tip, which I did when I was relocating from California to Colorado. Um, so I want every single person tonight, not right now, because we're being present, but tonight, or maybe during one of the breaks, to create your life list. Okay, and I want you to take out your phone and I want you to start a note and then start adding to it. Little things, big things, don't overthink it. It's yours, it's nobody else's. But I want you to do that tonight. Think of me tonight before you go to bed. And I'm gonna end today with a poem that I found after I got the terminal diagnosis that I feel like encapsulates life for me and for everyone in this room. Life is amazing, and then it's awful. And then it's amazing again. And in between the amazing and the awful, it's ordinary and mundane and routine. Breathe in the amazing, hold on through the awful, and relax and exhale in the ordinary. That's just living heartbreaking, soul healing, amazing, awful, ordinary life. And it's breathtakingly beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Humbling, humbling stuff. Our next guest runs an arts nonprofit right here in San Diego. You've already had a little taste of her work this morning. She teaches, mentors, and coaches underserved youth, even at one point, giving up her own apartment to keep the lights on for them. Flash forward to this year, when members of the Heartbeat Music Academy performed at the presidential inauguration in January, and July 30th has now been named Tyra Hawthorne Day in San Diego in her honor. We are so excited to welcome back to the stage Tyra and the performers of Thunder.
Thank you. It's so crazy because every time I hear, I'm always brought on and whenever I'm, it's mentioned that I gave up my place and lived in my apartment, I mean, in my academy for a couple of years, it still is like, wow, I really did that. I must have been insane. <laughs> Um, so before we start, I'm going to do a little project and I'm going to ask for one of my kids to volunteer to come on stage. Who is that right there on the end? Is that? Yeah. Who is that? Nasir? Come on up. <laughs> now, because you are such a good participant, I'm going to give you $20, this $20 bill. Do you want it? Okay, but <laughs> if I rip it, would you still want it? Yeah. Why? Because it's still $20. Because it's still $20. Good answer. That was the answer. That wasn't, and that wasn't rehearsed. <laughs> it wasn't rehearsed, but it goes right into my segment. So imagine being a young child. You, you're innocent. You have no um, choice on who your parents are. You just know your mom and your dad, they made you. But you grow up into in a community where one of your parents have done such harm to so many people in the community that you are the closest target to blaming. Growing up in Detroit, Michigan, my biological father, unfortunately, was a pedophile. He molested young ladies, he molested kids, and he even molested my mom for 14 years and I was the product of that molestation. Luckily, my mom was strong. She made a decision very early that she wasn't going to give us up, but that meant that she went from being a child to an adult to a mom, all in a matter of 14 years. But imagine growing up looking like him, carrying his last name, because mind you, he's 18 years older than my mom. So in that time frame, he has control. He's signing a birth certificate. He names me Tyra Kenyell Hawthorne. His name was Ricky Hawthorne. So I'm growing up in this, in this community. I'm being seen in grocery stores. I'm being seen on the same street that he was molesting little girls. And all they see is this face and this name. Now, mind you, he was, he was good. He wasn't, it wasn't one of those things where he was raping, like grabbing kids and then throwing them in the alley. This was patience over time. He earned trust. He earned trust of parents. He earned trust of kids. So unfortunately, I became... <laughs> the target in that same city. And being 13, 14 years old, I think I was 11 the first time it ever happened to me where I was walking in the grocery store and one of his victims saw me and decided to bash me right there in front of my mom and my little sister. Now my sister, she's only a year older, younger than me, but she is a no limit soldier, okay? Meaning that she will fight at the drop of a dime when it comes to her older sister. <laughs> So the fact that this had happened by another grown woman, I'm about 5'4", she's 5'2", she's ready to fight this lady that's 5'6". So I completely lost everything. I, I'll never forget the day that something inside of me died. And that was that day. I didn't know what my purpose was in life anymore. All I knew was that I was hated and I couldn't understand why I was so hated. At this time, I didn't even know the story. My mom finally told us the story at like 13, 14 years old, we're thinking my mom just birthed us out of love. And come to find out, she was a whole victim. And when something like that, some an adult or anyone of that nature, kills something in a kid, it takes, it's not even just that spirit, but they lose purpose, they lose focus, they don't know what they're gonna do. Unfortunately, the connection between my, my mom and I wasn't as strong as well. Had nothing to do with her. It just had everything to do with just the life that I was born into. So our relationship wasn't the best. Unfortunately, growing up into teenage years, she's still dealing with what she's going through. Man, we're bumping heads. She's looking at me. I'm a reminder of her. So I remember all the time in high school. I went to a, an extremely amazing high school. And I remember in high school, I had met a friend, and she became my best friend throughout the entire four years. So my, the end of my freshman year, going into my sophomore year, I'll never forget, I went into the band room with her. She was in a band, I wasn't, and I was crying. Something had happened at home. And I remember the band director, her name was Sharon Allen, super scary looking lady. I never said anything to her anytime I seen her in the hallways. 
She came in the room and she, in the in the bedroom and she said, "Hey, this is about the sixth or seventh time in two months that you've come in my band room and cried. What is wrong with you?" So I, I gave her a little bit, but I didn't give her too much. And she said, "What do you want to do when you leave um, college? When you leave high school?" I said, "Well, I really don't know." I know I want to go to college, and I know I want to go to Grambling State University, but I don't know how to get there. I don't know what I'm going to do. She said, well, I could do one or two things for you. I could kick you out of my band room and tell you not to come back if you're going to keep crying, or I could teach you how to fight. And the way I'm going to teach you how to fight is I'm going to give you the choice of any one of those drums sitting there for you to learn how to play. And that is when I fell in love with music. That is the day that I found value. It was some, I was a little broken, a little torn, hurt, didn't know who I was. And this lady that knew nothing about me birthed something inside of me that I didn't even realize that 20 plus years later that I would give birth to. Just from her putting a drum in my hand, something I never had interest in. I thought I was going to be a basketball player. I was going to be the next Cheryl Swoops. I, I, I knew it. I was like, yes, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. But my mom was like, nah, I'm not taking you to the game. So I was like, dang. I can't do nothing but go outside, play, go to school and work. So um, 20 years, 20 plus years later, Heartbeat is born. And the reason why I named it Heartbeat was because I remembered that day that something died inside of me. And I knew that we, no matter where I was in the world, even growing up in Detroit, Michigan, whether I was in Detroit, whether I was in Virginia, because I was in the Marine Corps as well. So I went to Grambling, I was in a band, joined the Marine Corps, traveled the world. So whether I'm in Virginia, whether I'm in North Carolina, I'm in Louisiana, I'm in Detroit, or even here in California, there were always going to be kids that was going to need a Miss Allen. And I was her. And <laughs> I tell Miss Allen all the time, I say, you have no idea the life that you gave me, no idea that you rebirthed me. And what you did for me 20 plus years ago is just carrying on into a whole different generation. Um, as I'm finishing my speech, I'm actually going to have my kids come back on stage. We're going to close it out with them. Um, so when I decided to do Heartbeat, I named it Heartbeat because I felt like there were so many kids in the world today that had lost something. Somebody killed something inside of them. But I knew I just didn't want any, any kid. I knew the kids had to be specific. To me. So a lot of times people always ask me, how do you recruit? How do you recruit? I say, I don't recruit. I don't recruit at all. I, I let them find me because I only the ones who find me that I can see a little piece of myself in are going to be the ones that I can help. I, I realize and recognize I have a lane. I'm not here to help every kid, but there are specific types of kids that I'm here to help. So my message to you today as we could go ahead and close this out is that if there is something inside of you that has once died, there is something inside of you that you're struggling with, that has taken a part of you away that you're trying to find, don't give up. Don't allow it to make you lose value. Allow it to make you birth something that's going to change another life, change the world, create something inside of somebody else that you can utilize that for motivation. I remember when I was a kid, I hated the last name Hawthorne. I told myself when I went off to college, I was going to change what that name meant. And now in San Diego, I have a whole day named after me, and that name has purpose. A name that once meant hurt now means change. So we're going to go ahead and close this out. I am going to allow my kids to take it away the only way we know how, the heartbeat way. Let's go, Kenneth.
Let's give it up for Tyra Hawthorne and Thunder Squad. Show them some love. They're off to school. That was awesome. That certainly gets your heart beating, doesn't it? Well, speaking of heart, as the head of customer experience at MindBody, I love a good customer service story. And our next guest has a great take on a strange paradox, being unstoppable by stopping. Please welcome the co-founder of Box.com and Entrepreneur Magazine's 50 Most Daring Entrepreneurs, Che Huang. Uh, it's great to be here, everyone. Um, I was sitting in the green room just absolutely inspired. Uh, usually I'm looking through my notes, looking through the sides, uh, but I was just locked in. Everyone before me has made it uh, a, a tough act to follow. All the stories that we've heard today, I know I'm definitely going to bring home with me uh, as I head back to the East Coast. Um, I have to admit, uh, yesterday, as the organizers, at the folks at MindBody definitely know, there was a really good chance I wasn't going to be able to make it today. So I was flying in from uh, the New York, New Jersey area. So as you guys probably saw, there were tornadoes, there was flash flooding. And I just thought in my mind, I was like, geez, like, I, like I'm in this session that's called Unstoppable. Uh, and it's not called Unstoppable except for weather delays. So I was like, OK, <laughs> I'm still going to make it. So I hopped in an Uber, and we're going. And I was like, we've got a mission at hand. we got to do this. And so I'm in the Uber. It didn't start raining that much just yet, but I'm in the back here. I see someone stopped ahead of us on the side of the highway. And you know, I tell the Uber driver, you know, my flight's probably going to be delayed. So hey, brother, you know, if you want to if you want to stop or at least see if everything's OK, because he had his hood up, like, um, you know, I don't mind. You know, I, we're not flying anytime soon anyway. So um, uh, the Uber driver looked me dead in the eye through the mirror. And I was like, oh, OK. Uh, he was like, we're not stopping. And I was like, OK, this, uh, this person's rather unstoppable. And I thought, wow, like, he is tied to that mission, that Uber mission of just moving people, getting me to where I need to be. So I said, wow, like, does the, Uber, does the mission really drive you that much? Like, because that's pretty extreme, man. Like, we could have helped him. Uh, uh, and he looked, and he's like, what mission? I'm not on a mission. And I was like, well, why, why aren't we stopping? And he looked me dead in the eye and said, you know damn well he was offered an extended warranty. Uh, and I, I was, I was like, I was like, wait, that, that's not just me. Wait, I thought they were just calling me every day, offering me this warranty. Uh, and so it was a real. Uh, so I, uh, in a very difficult night, I, I had quite a good laugh uh, uh, all the way because I was like, man, that guy, that guy should be here on stage uh, I instead. But uh, but overall, I just wanted to kind of come up here, tell you guys the story of Box and kind of what drives us, what drives me, and how that's evolved over time, and why I'm really excited for all of you guys here today. So when you think about the Box mission, what do we do and, and how do we do it? Well, we try to help the world stock up through our technology. That is our mission statement, and that is what we do. Um, I like to say, in years past, I always kind of you know, was self-deprecating and said, you know, I'm a glorified toilet paper salesperson. Um, that's always kind of what we did. We sell a ton of bulk toilet paper. So you can imagine this was a scene last year when there was nothing on the shelves, like we were sitting in the Indiana Jones factory of toilet paper. It was like that warehouse in the final scene of Indiana Jones. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We are about to get robbed. Uh, because this has a, you know, and it was the first time anyone has ever said street value of toilet paper. Uh, so this has a street value of X, Y, Z, and I was like, oh my gosh. And you know, like friends I hadn't talked to in like 20 years since high school hit me up on Facebook. Hey, you know, it's been a long time, but uh, you know, you got that connect for that toilet paper, and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, maybe. Uh, and so I drove around uh, my neighborhood driving, uh, delivering toilet paper, and so. If this was the kind of end scene of 2020, if you rewind back to where we first started, we started in a garage in central New Jersey. That's where I grew up. We started in a two-car garage. And you might think, and some of you guys probably have started businesses in garages. If you haven't, you know, it's like the dream come true. It's like, I want to start a business in my garage. I want to live that dream. All the great companies start in a garage, right? And so um, whenever I'm asked that, I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, man, you, you don't want to do that. Like, I, I, I was 30 years old sitting in a garage. This was the garage. It was not pretty. Um, I was like neighbors, like 
were, were wanting to move because of us. They, I was like that weird person. And so there was like the elementary school bus stop on my corner. And I, you know, it was really self-conscious. The kids would walk by my garage, cross the street, and then walk, and then cross the street back. And I'm like, OK, I get it. I am that weird dude selling candy and toilet paper out of his garage. So uh, I was kind of uh, uh, self-conscious. But you know, we kept going. We kept going with that mission. But this is where it all started. We started hiring. We got a few orders. We started hiring neighbors family, friends, uh, anyone that just wanted to come on and live this dream of starting a, a business in our garage. So we started setting up rows. Uh, there was like some of the uh, Mrs. Meyer stuff that went under our pack table. Uh, but it really wasn't going anywhere uh, until we had that final spark. And as we look at this next kind of um, um, uh, video, you just have to remember whatever people say on TV is absolutely true. It is, it's, it's proven. Science, it is fact. So just believe what they say. Uh, and then also, too, you, like wine, drinking wine at 10 a.m., 11 a.m. is really, really good for business. So uh, here we go. Particularly excited about yes. this is a warehouse club on your phone. So you don't have to go to those big stores to get your bulk items, discount prices, what? free shipping. Shipped. Free shipping free. to your door on most items. Some are, some you pay for shipping, but most for free. That's genius. Just because you're saving gas, yeah, and headache, yes. and time, headache, everything. Time. Love that. Genius. genius. Love it. Okay. <laughs> so we're sitting there in the garage uh, watching this because they give us a heads up the day before. It's like, hey, do you mind us talking about you? on, you know, do you mind Kathy Lee and Hoda talking about you guys? And I was like, no. Uh, and so we didn't think they would actually do it. When they actually did it, it was like a comical scene. The order started coming in. We used to have this bell every time an order came in. It was like, turn the bell off just because it's getting really, really stressful. So we started hiring everyone we can get our hands on. We undrilled the garage door. There was no garage door. We undrilled the door going into the garage door. Even less kids were starting to walk in front of my house at that time. Uh, and so it really, you know, dropping off pallets on my driveway. If you zoom out a bit, you, to this day, actually, please don't stalk me, but if you did on Google Street View, you would see this like 40 foot container in front of my house and just cars up and down my street and just people holding boxes on my front yard. But overall, kind of what we found was that we, we, we were in a great opportunity. This was every order that we first shipped after that, uh, after that um, uh, Today Show hit, then like a quarter la later, then one quarter uh, after that. So it was this really, really interesting rise that we had while we we're all sitting in the garage. And so for me, one of the key lessons, and there's a few here, one of the key lessons here was like, one, we got to get the F out of my garage, because by this point, like it was full on. Like it was really, really bad. But two, we had to automate, and we did so. Uh, and now if you go into one of our fulfillment centers, this is what it looks like. So less than, you know, seven years, oh, well, actually we were at year four when this happened. 40 feet clear height, we're no longer in a garage anymore. You're seeing like these totes walk, roam around this facility. It's a gigantic facility filled with toilet paper, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, but we basically kind of evolved as a business along the same vision. There was that vision lock, that mission uh, was very, very critical in what we did. Even today, if you go into the next video, uh, we actually build our own robots. So we said, you know, screw the conveyor belts, we can do better. So in our newest fulfillment centers, we now design, engineer, and build our own robotics. And so if you come into like our newest fulfillment centers, there's these bots roaming around, it is quite trippy. Um, they, you know, they have like a LiDAR system, they stop, it is just the wildest thing ever. Because for people joining the company now, they think this is normal. But for me, every time I walk into one of these facilities, I'm like, geez, this, it wasn't that far removed from my garage. And let me tell you about my garage and the story about the kids. Uh, but overall, when you have that vision lock, you can do a lot of things. You can trust each other. You don't need to micromanage the team anymore. Because again, whoever hires the best, the brightest, whoever says, I want to hire the best people from the best universities, from the best experience, sit them, sit them down and tell them exactly what the hell to do. Uh, it just doesn't, it just defies logic. And so we trust our team quite a bit, even down to these handwritten notes. So today, uh, just about every order still gets a handwritten note from the packer. It's not an auto pen, it's not pre printed. Someone is writing it. And so if you order diapers, sometimes you'll get say hi to the baby for us. If you order the next size up, you might get, you know, oh, growing up so fast. And so, you know, people often ask, well, does it ever go off the rails? Because you're not checking every card, right? Well, I'm like, yeah, we don't check every card, but there's only been a few times 
where like it's been kind of uncouth what was written. And so, you know, um, yeah, it's creativity. It's a fine line between kind of creativity and craziness. So there's a very fine line. And so we sell everything in bulk. So toilet paper, paper towels. Uh, we're trying to get more healthy snacks on there now. But overall, we sell everything in bulk. And that includes uh, contraception. So we sell, I think, a, a 40 pack of Trojan condoms. And so someone, not a business, someone bought four 40 packs of Trojan condoms for just self-use, 160 condoms. And so the packer sitting here, hmm, order nothing else. I know what I'm going to write. Uh, 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 and so uh, it, was at, it was at that time we had to put guardrails. Uh, and so, uh, but Rest assured, that person still works for us. We were, there was a big debate of whether they should be fired or actually promoted. He's worked very hard since. Uh, he, uh, uh, he's been since promoted. So it was uh, quite creative uh, on their part. Uh, um, but overall, um, kind of what we found is this. And so that was the mission. Mission is very critical. It, couldn't, it can be one of the critical components of being unstoppable. Timing can also be. So if you think about it in your own lives, if you guys run your own businesses, timing can be very important, whether it's catching it at the right time or at the peak of the right time or as the timing shifts. But overall, it's really, really important. Look at this chart you have here today. It took 46 years for electricity to permeate through a quarter of the American population. Radio, 31 years. Television, are you seeing a trend? The web, seven years. If you think about cryptocurrency, uh, if you think about you know, the stock market even, um, that curve is getting sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper. So I like to think, you know, I, I've watched Wolf of Wall Street a few times. If Jordan Belfort came up to me and said, you know, sell me this pen, young man, I would say, this pen is a damn NFT backed by cryptocurrency. Boom, you know? And so if you think about it, like, that is timing these days. You put anything into an NFT, it is going to sell solely because of timing. So mission, potentially critical. Timing, potentially critical. Purpose, also potentially critical. So mission and purpose, again, a very fine line, but it is different uh, in my mind. So overall, uh, what I would like to kind of end with us, end our session here today with is really finding purpose. And so I like to say, um, oh, you know, we'll, we'll bring you back to that original time when we were still kind of barely out of the garage. We were in our first fulfillment center. It was still largely manual, um, but we were starting to hire people we didn't know. So the company was about 100 people by this time. Um, and what we generally did uh, was promote from within the company. And when we promoted from within, we would have this really great dinner. Um, I, I, you know, at this time, we were still in Central Jersey. So you know, we would just do it up, either at Chili's or Cheesecake Factory or something like that. And so um, you know, it's Central Jersey. It's, uh, uh, and so we'd get the private room. Maybe we'd go to like Seasons 52, or whatever it's called. And so we had the private room. And one of the most memorable moments um, was this. So again, we barely had HR at that moment. Our HR rep was a recent, or he was a current, uh, uh, he was getting his degree in HR. He wore supreme hats uh, uh, to the facility. Uh, uh, it just, when you saw him, you were like, probably not an HR professional just yet in his career, but he got there uh, in the end. But basically, we had this private room. We were in the back um, and sitting there. And so uh, drinks started flowing. Remember, these were the days really before HR. So first drink, everyone's happy. A lot of these folks, remember, this is the first time they've ever had access to a career. This is the first time they've ever been celebrated in a corporate environment. So all the executives would fly in. There weren't that many at the time, or drive in. And we'd really be honoring these folks. And so as we're sitting there in this back room, we're just having a grand old time. So two drinks happen, three drinks happen, four drinks happen, and things are getting pretty kind of like pretty wild. Uh, I, I look over, and someone clanks his glass, um, and it's Tim. So Tim, as you can see, is a Lakers fan. So Tim was an early employee in the company. Um, uh, he clanks his glass, uh, you know, had probably a few too many drinks already, uh, stands up uh, and says, I've got, I've got something to say. Uh, and I'm like, oh, geez, this is the most short-lived promotion in the history uh, uh, of, of promotions. Like, don't do this, Tim. I'm sitting there, like, mortified. I look over at our HR rep, who has a Supreme hat, and he literally does this. And I'm like, 
Oh my gosh, you know, he, in his mind, he's thinking, I read all about a situation like this. I am ready. And so I'm like, don't do this, please. What is he going to say? What is he going to say? Um, uh, so he says, I got something to say. Um, uh, and I was like, okay, this is, you know, um, and I got something to say to the CEO. And so he looks me right in the eye and I'm like, this, you know, I thought maybe we can recover. This is like started here. This is going downhill real quick. So I'm sitting there mortified. Um, and then he says, y'all don't know me. And I was like, okay, I, wow, this is going real low here. Um, and so he says, I actually am college educated, uh, paralegal uh, at uh, uh, one of the largest law firms in New Jersey. Um, but Tim now uh, was our box loader. He picks up boxes, he loads them on a truck. He picks up boxes, loads them on a truck. That is his job every day, day in and day out. He was never late. And what he said to us was that throughout the last recession, he had gotten laid off and he couldn't find stable employment again. He couldn't find it for himself. And he said, I just, I never had access to potentially joining a technology company. I never had access to another shot at a career. Um, and so when I saw your advertising uh, or your advertisement for someone in the facility, I said, I can do that. I can join this tech company. There's not too many tech companies in central Jersey. Um, and for that chance, uh, he looked me in the eye and said, I will never let you down. Um, and to this day, that, it's one of those moments where our, our, our mission is to help the world stock up through technology. Our timing, by all accounts, is pretty good. But that has nothing to do with our purpose. And what our purpose is in life, what our purpose is in our business life, what our purpose is in our family life can only be discovered by yourself in moments like these. And what I'd like to impart on you guys is that it can be about the mission, it can be about the timing, but it really is about the purpose that makes you unstoppable. And so I hope all the inspiration today, I hope everything you've heard and everything you're about to hear will help you all find your purpose. Thank you very much. Inspirational stuff. And the street value of toilet paper, something I will never forget. Um, so our last presenter is, and I'm very, very excited to, uh, to, to, to bring her onto stage, but she has crafted a unique voice and sound using the most elemental of instruments, her own body. She uses music to spread a message of love, acceptance, and compassion while creating a space for people to be their true selves. I can keep talking about it, but it's just unbelievable, and this you are going to have to experience for yourselves. So please welcome recording artist and world beatbox champion, Butterscotch. I haven't performed live in two years. This is like, wow. Like humans, yes, connection, eyeballs, wow. Not just like chats and everything. This is this is incredible. Yeah, this is, um, So this first song I'm going to do is called Accept Who I Am. And it's a story about, uh, about my life growing up with depression and 
all the things that come along with it and my journey to be who I am today. So everything you hear is being recorded live right now. So um, it's basically like I'm producing a live track. So here we go. And when you do things live, sometimes you mess up and you gotta restart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, let's take it back. Let's take it back. Back. <clears throat> Listen, listen. Judge, you messed up life, you can't get enough Pushing people down, like you wear a crown The king is dead, my time is now I'ma walk around like I own this shit Devin back down, cause I'm making hits Don't believe in violence, but I won't turn the cheek If it makes me weak, cause I hate you Flicked, makes me weak for my brothers and sisters Who lost their lives, now been the deep, deep Yeah, did it, Trying to live, can't you see what your hate does to me? I'm trying to live, 
Mohawk, Navajo, Cherokee, Iroquois, we all from the same tribe, written in the same sky, y'all gonna live, we all gonna die, we go back into earth, begin a new birth, karma decides, y'all new birth, will you be a butterfly, will you be dirt, serve new time for those you hurt, step on me and I'll step on you for all the things that you put me through, tired of hiding, tired of fighting, can't understand, my life is frightening, I'm never gonna see what you want me to be, a grain of salt and an NC, I don't take what you say seriously, so stop, I hate and let me free, free, free. Just let me, just let me be free With so much happening in the world I just want to be who I am, yeah We never know how much time we got, yeah Cause we got to be unstoppable No time to waste now, no time to waste now yeah, 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 come on, yeah, 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 I'm trying to live, can't you see, what you hate, that's to me, I'm trying to live, I'm trying to live, let me be free, I'm trying to live, can't you see what you hate does to me? I'm trying to live, I'm trying to live. Let me be free, just let it be free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, for this next part, I want to create a song with everybody here. Um, while I've been doing virtual events uh, for different companies, different uh, festivals and everything, I've taken words from the chat, like from a live chat, but since we have humans here, <laughs> um, I just want to make up a song on the spot. Like, it's going to be completely original right now. So. Um, I don't know if there's someone with a micro microphone, like if someone, okay, yeah. So does anybody have any topics that you want me to sing about? Or any words? Hope. Hope? Okay. Uh, anything else? Unity. unity? Love. Hope, unity, love. Okay. Purpose. What? Carpets? <laughs> oh, purpose. <laughs> I like carpets. <laughs> Okay, hope, unity, love, carpets. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> um, let's see. Maybe piano sound? All right. <clears throat> I think. Here we go. Hope, unity, and love. 
come together today in sunny San Diego. Yeah, we are unstoppable. We are untouchable. He would do it live, just kicking it for you, alright. We're gonna get down, get down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody around the world, if you like. Or if you're watching on the digital stream, yeah, yeah, on the computer screen, yeah, I hope you're filled with hope, love, hope, unity, and love, yeah, 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 yeah. hope, unity, and love, hope, unity, and love, 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 love. hope, unity, and love, hope, unity, and love. We're destroying nature Who I got to talk to in legislature I can't even breathe without inhaling death More than half of our nation is sinking in debt We're trapped in the system that never's done good But we keep on rising, gotta get about the hood Too concerned with politician change starts with us We've come too far to be the back of the bus Not just talking black, all colors included Nobody on earth deserves to be excluded From my people in the Amazon, my people in the ghetto To my people with the trailer parks living in the middle, everyone deserves a chance to see a change in their world. We go a bright future to every boy and girl. I'm sick of seeing the same news. It's time to put it to a step. I'm never quitting on the clock. Cause you and I all we got. Come on. Hope, unity, and love. Come on. Put your hands together. Come on. Hope, unity, and love. Yeah. Sing it with me. Come on. Hope, unity, and love. Yeah, yeah. Get up off your feet. Come on. Hope, unity. And love, yeah, yeah, come on. Hope, unity, and love, yeah. We gotta give it all. Hope, unity, yeah, yeah. And love. We gotta give it all that we got. Come on. Hope, unity, yeah, yeah. And this love. is all we got. Yeah, this is all we got. Got, got, got. Hope, unity, yeah, yeah. and love. Yeah. Let me hear you sing. Come on. Hope, unity, and love. Come on, come on, sing it. Hope, unity, and love. All right, come on, a little louder. Hope, unity, and love. Yeah, yeah, come on. Hope, unity, last and time, love. last time, last time. Hope, unity, and love. Come on, come on. Hope, unity, and love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope, unity, and love. and carpets. We have our own song by Butterscotch, everybody. Oh, we do it. Love. Perfect. Wow, what a morning. It's been incredible. The ideas, the spark, the stories of these incredible people. What a tremendous reminder of the power we gain from sharing our experiences with each other. Agreed. And we want to give a deep, heartfelt thank you to all of our presenters and to you, our audience. And if all of our presenters, I think, have underscored just how unstoppable each and every one of us in this room is. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your time and passing along these stories of action, determination, and grit. One more round of applause, please, and thank you all.